Guys, just before we get started, if you're loving the podcast, can you please go leave us a five-star review on Spotify and please make sure that you subscribe on whatever channel that you listen to us on. It helps us out dramatically. In life, we choose the path that we're least afraid of. So a lot of the decisions that we're making is based off fear. And I think there's something, if we won't wind it back, there's something very special, this idea of how can you find people that are doing what you want to do? That's through podcasts, through online programs or courses, or even people in your network. Or how can you work for people that are doing what you want to do and just learn and see it? Because when you start to get that view of like, oh, well, actually, maybe this person's not that much smarter than me, then you start to believe that you can do it. And that belief and that mindset shift is so powerful, right? Nathan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's good to do an in-person podcast in hometown, homegrown Melbourne. Yeah, we're, it's, it's definitely, we're, we're about it. How long are we out of lockdown now? A That's year? six months. No, six no, months? we came out, so we came out of lockdown. I remember even in Jan, like, yeah, I, I, sorry, yeah, probably about seven, eight months because I remember thinking, oh, um, am I going to be able to see my family for Christmas? Remember that? Mm. Like, yeah, so no, we've been locked down for a long time. Yeah, because we would, you know, we... We were obviously about three months into what we were doing then. And it was like, I think we went into that last lockdown. We had heaps of momentum up and it was kind of like, we're back in lockdown. And I was like, oh, do we go Zoom? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Like we were, you know, we were putting so much effort in, in here. Uh, we didn't end up doing it. And luckily we didn't, we came out. But as, as you said, it's great to be doing in person again. I just feel like it's, um, you know, it's, it's great to meet people, you know, and mm-hmm. to, to actually see people again. Yeah, no, there's something very special. Uh, all right, so I've been a big, f- big fan of uh, Founder and, and what you've been doing. Uh, obviously, being a, an entrepreneur myself, and and uh, you know, I've done some of the courses that you've re- you've released, and and just love what you've you've really been able to do. I think you know Australia can you know uh, lacks you know that that entrepreneurial media and that kind of vibe you know at, at times mm. um, and I think you know you guys have been able to do really well in that in that space and and you know drive the culture that comes with business a lot of the time which absolutely love so I'd love to start with the story of how it all got started and, and a little bit about you know what, what it's the, the founder startup story yeah thanks man uh, look it's crazy. It's it's almost been 10 years now, <laughs> 10 years uh, since I started Founder. So March 2013, launched Founder, which started as a magazine. Uh, we're so much more than a magazine now. Uh, we still produce the magazine every month, but our real focus is online education and, and really trying to find people that have done incredible things and sharing their stories, but at at an even deeper level now and just really helping people start or grow a business through our online education platform. Um, So so the story started with me honestly looking for a job. Uh, I really wanted to do work that I enjoyed and I believe life is too short to not do work you don't enjoy. And um, I saw this opportunity, I I was working in IT support at the time and I saw this incredible opportunity to start this digital magazine and at first it was going to be in horse racing with my housemate at the time and uh he he ended up getting a job at racing.com and he's on the tv every day and uh, he couldn't he couldn't do it so i thought oh you know i'm really interested in business and entrepreneurship why don't i just do this magazine for fun and see where it lands and uh you know i started to interview people and no one would get back to me right like it's not like how it is now and uh no one would get back to me it was really a real struggle to get interviews for this magazine that no one ever heard of that hadn't launched yet and uh the people that I did end up interviewing I had so much fun and what I started to realize is these stories are so incredible I needed to share them with the world and that's how Founder was born it started with this magazine and sharing stories of people that have started businesses with no experience or skills in whatever it is that they're doing and they're somehow making it work and back then I thought entrepreneurship was hot right 10 years ago now it's really hot and it's probably even going to get hotter but 
back then I started to hear stories around friends of friends that were starting online businesses, friends of friends that were doing crazy stuff. And I was just genuinely really curious how the hell they were doing it. And that's how Founder was born. I started with the first magazine, the first one we launched, made $5.50. And I did it while I was working my day job, um, you know, on the side. And uh, so I did the magazine on the side. And then uh, as time went on, we became much more than a magazine and we started to produce a lot of media content. We launched a podcast and, uh, and we started to produce content, written audio, video, and all these different channels. And then eventually um, realized that there was a much deeper play with what we were building. How can we get the people that we're interviewing on the front covers of our magazine or on the podcast to go a level deeper? You know, if, some, if we interview somebody that's built four multi-million dollar e-commerce stores um, and clearly has a formula and there's so much rubbish out there online, well, how do we get them to teach and give back? Or if we meet somebody who spent $100 million profitably on Facebook ads and they talk about on the podcast how they're doing and how they're making ads work, let's get them to, to give back further. And then we start to build out this platform around this idea of, of how can we build an alternative to MBA? How can we build an alternative business school where the people that are teaching have actually done it? Mm. And that's been a big journey for us uh, ever since uh, we, we just launched Founder Plus, which is the All Access Membership Pass. And that's, that's where it's all going. I want to talk about that. We will definitely get into that decision and the strategy behind that as well. But I want to go back to like something you said, you know, around you kind of just started this business. You had no experience doing it um, and you kind of just started and you've seen that other people were doing it. Like what, what advice do you give to say someone who is say having doubt, you know, around starting a business or thinks that you need to be at a certain level to even start or you need to have prior experience or, or anything like that? Because, you know, I know that I, that's what I did and, and, and I'm doing now, you know, we just kind of started and said, I'm just going to have a crack at this. But I'd love to hear like, you know, a little bit about that and, and you were kind of just how you, you uh, maneuvered your way through and kind of thought about, you know, how do we get this off the ground? Yeah, look, it's really hard, right? Like that, it's easy to fantasize. It's easy to fantasize with ideas. It's easy to fantasize what life could be like if you did this, this and this and this works and all these other things. It's easy to compare yourself to others and what they've accomplished and achieved and be like, oh, well, you know, why aren't I here and I need to be here and there over there and... And I think really what it comes down to, I think, is is the mindset and how bad you want it. Um, so for me, I just couldn't rest. It, like something inside of me snapped, Kyle, where I was like, it wasn't even about starting a business for me at first. It was just really how do I do work that I enjoy? How do I do work that I'm passionate about? Life is too short to, for me, not, do work that is fulfilling. Mm. And I'm not saying that, you know, starting a business, growing a business, whatever it is, is 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 all enjoyable because it's actually not. <laughs> it's actually really tough and it's really hard. But it's it's incredibly fulfilling and you get to, you know, make your own job. And I guess for anyone that's listening that wants to start a business and you're feeling stuck, you're feeling doubtful, you're worried about failing, you're you're fearful of how others will perceive you. You're fearful of really at its core if it will work. Um, it doesn't really matter. Like it, it really, really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you know, you can spend a bit of money and it might not work. And I know it's easy to say that, but if you're working in a job right now, what's stopping you from just having a crack, doing something on the side, spending a bit of money, starting the business for one, two, three, four, five, ten grand or whatever it is, and just seeing what happens. And the worst that can happen is it doesn't work. And the worst is you get some skills and experience from it and you go again. Mm -hmm. But it's that mindset of just wanting it bad enough. And I think that you just can't be given, unfortunately. You can't be given that. And unfortunately, you have to, I believe, experience some sort of adversity or something inside of you to make that shift. Uh, because if you're comfortable right now, it probably ain't going to happen. If you're comfortable, but you're dissatisfied, it probably ain't going to happen. It has to come from letting go of that fear, 
Like, I think, you know, I think a lot of us have wanted to start a business, but we're really afraid. We're really afraid that we'll, we'll run out of money. We're really afraid that uh, how, how you'll be perceived by others. We're really afa- afraid of failing and how that will feel and what, your, what that means to your identity. And I think if you can work through that, those stories that your mind tells you, um, I think that's half the battle, right? That's, that's half the battle. Yeah. What do you think the relationship is with, say, risk then? Because, you know, that's the, that's the thing that I think people um, struggle with the most, right? It's like that, okay, me, uh, at, like, you know, if I have a job and I then have to go and start this business, like, you know, uh, I then have to take this risk. Mm. But I think, like, like, something that you mentioned, which I kind of resonate with as well, is like... Um, there's more risk on the side of not doing it than there is on the side of actually doing it, if that makes sense. Like, there's more risk for not starting the business rather than, you know, the risk that's associated with starting a business. Because I share the same the same kind of belief system as you where I was like, why did I get into podcasting? Well, it was like, what's the one thing that I could do that if it didn't work, uh, I could still get to do it for the rest of my life and be extremely happy? Mm. Uh, so I'd love for you to kind of touch on that because I think that's the, the thing that people struggle with the most. Yeah, well, look, when, when you think of risk, it, it's, it's, your, it's each individual's perception of what, what's on the table, what, what's at stake. But you can certainly stack the deck and that's how I've always perceived risk because I'm actually quite a risk-adverse person. Um, I don't like risk. And so let's think of like how I actually stacked the deck um, and gave myself the best possible chance to make found work. Mm. So the first thing was it only cost me two grand, probably three, two, so it was two grand for the software to create the magazine. That was two grand US. And then I probably spent another thousand US to make the first edition. And, you know, What's two or three grand on my credit card? I was already living from credit card to credit card, paycheck to paycheck. So um, for me, that was it was risky at the time. Don't get me wrong, but I wasn't going to lose it all, right? I was getting paid, you know, fifty, sixty grand a year or whatever it is, and and you know, what's a couple of grand, right? Like you know, I would have spent it on a holiday, right? And that's yeah. what I was doing. I was going from place to place to place, and you know, come back and work and then go another holiday, go to Europe, whatever, right? So, so the money aside, um, not, not that much risk. And then the other part of it was part of the software, they had training on teaching you actually how to build the magazine, how to put it together, all these different things, right? So once again, removing risk because I, there was actually some some handheld like there was people that were doing it right they, they were creating magazines and all sorts of other niches and categories and I think that's 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 really powerful right like how can you the question you have to ask is how can you learn from that person's blueprint that's already doing what you want to do do you need to go and work for somebody or apprentice with them do you need to enroll in an online program do you need to listen to find somebody that you admire, love, respect so much, you love what they're doing, go and listen to every single podcast that they've done and you'll start to work and map out a bit of a blueprint, Mm. right? So that's how you can remove risk even more. And then the last piece is just this idea of just giving it a crack and seeing what happens, you know? Like, that doesn't sound that risky to me, right? Like, most people, they spend $1,000 or $2,000 on an iPhone, right? I, I spent it on starting a business and the only thing that I was losing was time. Like, because if you don't have money, then you've got to have time. And I had all the time in the world to work, right? To work from, as I would, I would get home from my day job, I would work from, you know, 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Or if I didn't do that, I'd go and see my partner. I'd only work from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then I'd go and see my partner. And then... Or sh- and then I'd wake up at like 6 a.m. She'd still be sleeping. And then I'd do another couple of hours and then I'd go into the office. Sometimes I'd even I'd even do interviews. I was doing interviews via Skype because everyone <laughs> used to use Skype. There was no Zoom. I used to do them 
I'd find a, a meeting room at, at, at the company that I was working at. I'd find a meeting room, do an interview at 7 a.m. I'd take my Rode podcaster mic yeah. and I'd do a bang out an interview before I'd start work or even during a lunch break. And then I'd come home and I'd go again. So I was giving up my time, but that's not that risky, right? So when you really map it all out, you can actually stack the deck. And that's how I look at business always. How can I just keep stacking the deck so you, like you can lay it up that, that, that it becomes easier and easier and easier? Because then, yeah, it's not that risky when I laid it out for you like that, right, is it? It's actually, it's actually not that scary at all. No, and I think that's the, the lesson is like your, what you just explained then is like this relationship between time and money and understanding where you're situated on that scale and then knowing how to use that in your, to your advantage. Mm. You know, like my first business, same thing, had no capital, had a lot of time. So you figure out how do I deliver whatever I'm trying to deliver and create value for someone uh, and l- get those skills and, you know, like selling and, and you know, like, like um, marketing and, and then obviously, you know, trying to create value. And like you said, my first business was consulting. So you start to leverage maybe some softwares where you can deliver that consulting, mm. um, you know, whatever that is. So I think it's just that relationship between time and money that um, – if you can learn where to put yourself on that scale and then just go, okay, this is, start to map out how you can potentially make this happen. Um, you can, there's always going to be some risk, but you can avoid a lot of the, the I guess, the, the larger risks that come with starting a business, which I really loved. Yeah, I think there's also something very special around this idea of learning from others that have done it. Like, it is scary and it is risky trying to start a business and working it out for yourself. Like if you have this crazy idea for a business that nobody's ever done and you're trying to work it out by yourself, like that is risky and you're dropping all this money on it or you're doing like software or it's developed. Like that is risky, right? That is scary because there's a lot, like in life we choose the path that we're least afraid of. So a lot of the decisions that we're making is based off fear. Mm. And... I think there's something, if we won't wind it back, there's something very special, this idea of how can you find people that are doing what you want to do? That's through podcasts, through online programs or courses, or even people in your network. Or how can you work for people that are doing what you want to do and just learn and see it? Because when you start to get that view of like, oh, actually, maybe this person's not that much smarter than me, And you start to believe that you can do it. And that belief and that mindset shift is so powerful, right? Like, you know, let's just say it's not going to happen. But if Founder went bust tomorrow, right? Like, everything that I have in my mind, my mindset is still there. I can spin up something tomorrow, right? I I could start another business. I could do whatever I wanted. Because those lessons, those skills, those experiences, no one can take that away from me. Yeah, I... I laugh at that because it's, you know, obviously um, being in, a, you know, my, my third business now, it's like what I'm doing now <laughs> is so much, I guess, I'm not going to say the word easier, but I'm just like making so much ground now compared to say the first 10 years in business where you're just mm-hmm. learning so much. Like you're kind of grinding away for 10 years and then, you know, all right, now that you're in your, the second business, you can kind of navigate your way through, mm-hmm. you know, which, you know, you would, it's kind of to that point that you're saying now, like, um, and even, you know, with Founder, like you're obviously still trying to grow it and still trying to expand it and um, you're, you've got, you, you know, there's much more on the line now now than what was back then, but yeah. you learn how to manage that capacity, you learn how to manage that risk and, and then you use your skills to kind of continue that growth as well. Yeah, so look, um, in business there's levels, right? You know, we've been talking about the level of just starting and, you know, getting your first customer or getting a handful of customers and making a living out of it, right, and doing it full time. But unfortunately, the mind wants more. And unfortunately, it's never enough. You know, I've spoken to, you know, I've been grateful enough to speak to some of the richest people in the world. And one of my favorite questions to ask them is, is it ever enough? Like, you know, I interviewed the founder of Reddit, Steve Huffman, and, like, he's created one of the most popular, I think, top 10, 20 websites in the world. I'm like, you know, you, you've created a product that, that everybody uses. Like, is it ever enough? He's like, no. Nah. 
you know, I've interviewed uh, Joe Jebbia, the founder of Air, co-founder of Airbnb. Is it ever enough? No, it's never enough. And <laughs> that's the beautiful but also unfortunate thing because no, because it's never enough and because you always want more and because you want to keep growing and evolving, there's pain. You experience pain of, of learning things the hard way. So when it comes to, you know, founder, as time has gone on, I've always wanted more. I see this massive vision of how can we build one of the largest online business schools and entrepreneurial brands in the world that helps tens of millions of people every single week with our content. And it's like, there's a lot of pain that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that you know, we have to go through, you know, my team has to go through, I'm going through for us to get there. And there's a lot of hard lessons, right? And there's levels, like there's so many more levels ahead, like the, it never stops, even at Jeff Bezos' level, like it never stops. Um, and I think that's that's just the journey. Yeah. I want to go kind of to the start now and look at some of, say, some of the guiding principles that you'll bring to the table around getting your business, say, to that $1 million mark. You know, mm. what were some of the... What were some of the things that you guys did early on that you think the the audience can learn from, you know, that really helped you grow? Yeah, so I think um, first things first, you really got to get your, your selling channel right. Like you only need one. From my experience, this is from my experience, um, this is not just building founder but another business as well, uh, by my, helping my fiancé build an e-commerce business that got past a million dollars as well. Um, from my experience, you got to get your selling channel right and you only need one. Um, so once you've got your product or your service out there, you've got clients or, or customers and it's somewhat consistent, then, and, and you, you know, you, you've, you've kind of been scrappy to get them, um, then you need to find a way to predictably bring on more customers and it's your job to find that whether it's through you know this there's there's a, there's a thousand different tactics whether it's through cold outreach and then selling on the phone or booking a call whether it's through paid advertising you know a free lead magnet or whatnot whether it's through uh partnerships and you know finding other people that are in, like you know that have a similar audience to you and doing a rev share like there's so many different things but you've got to you've got to test many of those things and you've got to find something that you can just keep doubling down on like that one traction channel and just once you've found once you've found it really dial it up dial it up dial it up dial it up and from my experience it's that's how you get to to a million dollar a year business uh for founder it was instagram uh that was an absolute game changer for us still is and then even for my fiance's business health is that that was Instagram too, right? So you stick with what you know as well. Two s totally separate businesses, one selling digital products and effectively thin air and then another selling physical products. So you tend to stick with what you know. Um, but if it was a SaaS business, I don't know, maybe it'd be content marketing, maybe it would be, depending on the AOV, maybe it'd be a cold outreach and phone sales. I, I don't know. Um, but then as time goes on, you start to layer in more channels, right? So um, I think from my experience, that that's a key part. I think another key part is to get to a million dollars a year, you tend to need help, like uh, some capacity of help. You can't do it by yourself. Um, and you really have to look at it and go, hey, what are the things that I'm great at, but it's not valuable for, for me to be doing that where I could get somebody else to be doing it mm. or what are the things that I hate doing and I'm not really good at like how do you find those things where the you you really want to look at your time and how you can get leverage through other people and, and start to build a bit of a team and it doesn't have to be a massive team from my experience you can build a million dollar year company with like three to five people in your yeah. team like it, it just really depends like you know you did a, you got a consulting business you, you probably only need what five, 10, 15, 20 clients, and then you need, you know, two, three, four, five, five people to service them, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I think you need a team as well. So it's it's how do you find your selling channel that's repeatable? And then how do you start to look to, to leverage your time to build people around you so you can just focus on that selling channel and dialing that up? 
Guys, if you're loving this episode, make sure to take a screenshot, give us a tag, or even take a photo if you're watching it. Give us a tag, help spread the love. It helps us out dramatically. Hey guys, I really hope you're enjoying this episode with Nathan Chan, but I just wanted to take a little bit of your time to say thank you to our major sponsors, BizCover. Uh, they are powering the podcast currently. They are the reason we get to travel and have all the amazing guests on, uh, but they're also a really amazing company. They're a business insurer that are insuring Australians all over the country uh, and making sure that if something does go wrong in their business, uh, it's not painful and it's not deadly. Uh, if you're an e-commerce business, uh, having insurance is really, really important because anything that goes wrong with your product and you are liable uh, and with the way the economy is currently um, and manufacturing and shipping and all of these things and potentially stock going missing, just having your business covered uh, could save you a lot of pain. Uh, so if you're interested in getting a quote, uh, it's super easy. It only takes, you know, you can get insured in under 10 minutes and there's no paperwork involved. Uh, the, their link is in the show notes. Go check it out and get yourself a better deal. So with the with the selling channel, is it do you think it's a market dynamics thing in terms of what's hot, what's, you know, like is, is it about staying on um, the, the platform that's emerging or do you think it's more about finding which one you know you're going to be really, really good at and then just, you know, honing in on that, mastering that and then start to expand and maybe look at other opportunities? Yeah, look, there's no hard and fast rule, I think. It just depends, right? Like it depends what you naturally lean towards. There's people that build million dollar businesses and their and their and their traction channel is podcasting, right? Mm. You you we talked about Alex Cooper, right? She's that the she was the business of the podcast and then she grew the podcast through Apple and Spotify and all that kind of stuff and she sold sponsorships. Uh, but what what the real key for her was finding a partner for distribution, which was Barstool Sports. Mm. So she kind of shortcutted because she could have kept doing that podcast and it probably wouldn't have blown up. Bustle was what made it blow up. Yep. Right? So she so her traction channel was a partnership or a JV with a group that already had a massive audience and then it just took off. So it really depends, um, yeah, where where your natural skill sets align towards. Um you know, like at Founder, we're starting to build a, a bit of a phone sales team now because we know naturally people have questions and, you know, there's a human element to having those questions and having those questions answered. But naturally, I didn't know. I've, I've never been around building a phone sales team or an inside sales team whatsoever, mm. right? So we have, you know, all these people that have inquiries and they're booking calls now and like, how do you build that out? And what does the team look like? And how do you, you know, uh, these are things I don't know. So I've got somebody, you know, helping me with that. So... Mm -hmm. I think it just really depends on what you know, what you're, what you're naturally leaning towards, and then what you test and what gets you the most traction fast. Yeah, beautiful. And so um, the second point that you made around team, uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about structure of the mm. team and, and, you know, especially in the early days because it's different in the early days than what it is you know, in the later days. There's, you know, you kind of talked about outsourcing things that you know may not be revenue generating activities um, but they still need to get done um, as a founder like how do you know and, and I know it's going to be different for every business but um, how do you know what you should be outsourcing and what you shouldn't be outsourcing or what what team members you need to bring in what and uh, you know over you know or that are, are more of a priority compared to say others yeah so for me it yeah, it depends on the person, right? For But for me, this is how I look at it. Um, if I want to grow that business, I'm looking at what, what, are the, what are the first 5, 10, 15, 20 hires that I can make that, that focus on sales and revenue, but also fulfillment. So it's, it's really product and revenue. Um, that's, that's where the founder should be spending 80% of their time on on product sales and marketing uh, or product and revenue um, or pro yeah, product and sales and um, you need to you need to hire accordingly to keep boosting boosting sales but then also maintaining fulfillment customer and client experience mm. um, and that's all you should be thinking about you can outsource all the rest of your operations you, like your, your shared services your graphic designs, your copywriting, your web development, your finance. 
you can outsource all of that and when it comes to building a team from my experience and perspective you really just need to go all in on product and, and marketing and sales. And do you feel like that can sometimes be what catches people out a little bit? Like, you know, they might have one or the other going really well, but struggling to balance that act of being able to generate demand and, and then also, you know, keep fulfilment, you know, at the level that it was when the demand maybe wasn't as high and, and that kind of balancing act. Yeah, it's always a bal- balancing act, right? Because then when you really get sales and marketing dialed, and you're just like, oh, wow, we're doing really, really well. Oh, let's go hire more people. And then bang, 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 bang. And then you've got all these people and you've got this new cost base. And then you're like, oh, sales and market is going backwards. How do we get it back up again? Like, <laughs> And so, yeah, it depends. Now we get into the business models and we can get into all sorts of things, right? Like um, I was watching this interesting video with this guy called Alex Homozi the other day. Incredibly He's smart He's everywhere, guy. isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he, and he posed a really interesting question that I, I really, really like, and it, it's a good one for people to think about. And it was, he asked the question, what if, what if your customer or what if, what if all the people that have ever bought a product or service from you are still buying from you right now? That's what you need to think about. Imagine that. Because your business becomes far more easier if you if you've got that and so you know these are some of the things that to be honest i wish i was thinking about with founder right like you said you've enrolled in in some of our courses what if what if you know when when you did you could see that you could sign up for founder plus then and there right could be interesting i was on founder plus three weeks ago yeah there you go so it's an interesting thought so it comes back to the model as well right like if you have predictability in your revenue then things can get easy if you have software like you know you, you've got some form of lock-in like you're solving a problem so it's a massive can of worms call it like i don't know where you want to no, go no keep it. going let's, yeah, let's yeah. go yeah like i don't know where you want to go with it but yeah i think i think uh it, it is a balance it is it is definitely a balance of when you focus just on sales and marketing versus then you've got fulfillment and you've got to focus on fulfillment. It comes down to your product or your service as well. It's such an interesting conversation. Like obviously in the consulting business, we see a fair bit of this. And, and so like I was having a conversation the other day and the idea being that it's, it's almost like the need to keep in growing your audience, um, but making sure that you do get that repeat purchase because it can be, it's much easier to exhaust your audience, uh, you know, and if you you don't have a product that keeps people coming back, um, you've got to make sure that your audience is growing at a quicker rate than what your churn is, mm. right? And then, you know, like that's the interesting conversation around that, I think, is like um, understanding how to navigate that, which is kind of what you're talking about, is like that balancing act. So it's just like, you know, you know it's a conversation. I actually, you know, we had it with someone the other day where it was like, you know, didn't grow their audience, the churn started to get a you know grow higher because they just started you know had a new team and and then all of a sudden you know if you're not growing that audience and you exhaust your um you know your your sorry and you, your churns up high and you know you're starting to lose clients and it's you kind of get to this point where demands you know wil- welts away so it's a really good point of kind of what you just you mentioned around you know business model but that balancing act between the two. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's always going to be a, from my experience thus far. It's always it's always a tug and war, mm. right? It's always a tug and war, and it's never enough. And we all have limited resources, right? Like, <laughs> and and it's all about allocating capital in the right places and making strategic bets. And some pay off and some don't, but you just got to keep keep trying. Yeah. So, what don't people know about scaling a business? You know, like if we're talking about beyond that one million mark or kind of once you kind of start to get out of that startup phase and more into a a business that's really operating. Yeah, scale Uh, up, yeah. Yeah, what what don't people know about that that you think they can learn a lot from? Businesses are built by people. Now, I know that sounds very, very simple um, and it sounds very, very obvious, but some uh, someone was really smart once told me that and that's and I think that's that's the key takeaway when it comes to scaling a business you need good you need good people and even in today's climate good people are hard to find and good people are hard to retain mm. 
And, you know, part of what keeps people is, is the culture, it's the vision, it's the mission, it's the values, it's the experience they're going to get, it's the career opportunities, it's the opportunities um, to learn. It's so much, right? And I think that's the that that's the most difficult part that I've really, really wrestled with, to be honest with you, Kyle, is businesses are built by people and it's your job to go out there and find the best possible people that you can find, but not only find, but they've got to be the right culture fit and they've got to have the right skills and experience, but then also you've got to retain them. And... That's tough. Mm-hmm. That's that's really really tough, especially right now. But in yeah. this climate, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, I think that's probably the thing that people don't really think about is, you know, you get past a million bucks and you're just like, oh, I'll just put more money in ads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I'll just put yeah. money more money in ads, or I'll just hire a few more salespeople, and you know, like, and it just. Yeah, it just ain't that easy. It's 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 really tough. It gets tougher. I reckon. I reckon it gets tougher when you want to go from you know seven figures to eight figures or eight figures to multiple eight figures. It gets even tougher, man, because all of a sudden you've got all these people. People come and go. You know, I. It's really funny. I used to. I there was a point in time when no one left founder, no one, and I used to. I used to be so proud of that. Yeah. And I used to even say that to people in interviews and people were like shocked. They were like, oh, geez, that sounds like a lot of pressure. Um, and I don't know what it was. I think I was on a good streak. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it, was, maybe it was the fact that it was all fun and, and you know, people weren't held to, to account as much as they should have been or, or whatever. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, there, there's a lot there. But I think the, in summary, uh, yeah, to scale a business, you need really good people and you've got to retain them. What kind of transformation did have you gone on then? Because obviously getting a business from zero to a million or, or whatever it is, that startup phase is very technician orientated. It's mm. very hands-on. And, and then, you know, your answer to the following question is, well, no, it's about people and it's, a, you know, and, and so on. So it sounds like you've gone on a bit of a transformation of like getting an understanding of, um, you know, founder on a deeper level, yourself on a deeper level, and then how you mesh those two together to create the culture to, you know, and, and kind of obviously to continue building. Yeah, well, look, I think when it comes to continuing to continually build, we talked about you need people and people need leaders, and you need great leaders and leaders that can not only lead teams but lead teams of leaders, right? That's that's where you eventually get to. Um, and that's really tough as well, finding great leaders, mm. um, finding people with great skills and experience leading teams or leading teams of teams. And, uh, yeah, that's been a journey in of itself, right? Um, I've made every mistake in the book. I've, uh, you know, I've hired really good friends and over time unfortunately the business outgrew them and you know i'm still really good friends with some of these people right like i'm really good friends with all these people in fact but um you know that that's a tough one uh you know you've got people that aren't performing and you have to you know effectively let them go like this is tough stuff right holding people to account like you know it's you know, we've got these targets and we've got to hit them. You commit to these targets. Like these are, this is leadership. So you not only do you need to find great people, retain great people, but you as a founder, you need to elevate from actual founder to CEO. And that is something that nobody tells you about. That you've actually got to learn how to run a business <laughs> with goals and KPIs and strategy every quarter and how do you check in on that strategy and how do you check in on you know what are the levers that you can tweak right because there's more sophistication to the business like these are the sorts of things that yeah nobody talks about you just think oh you know just spend more money on ads hire some more people and it's it's awesome but 
yeah, you actually have to elevate, you as the founder have to elevate to a level where you're not really the founder anymore. You're actually running the business and you're running the operations and you're not a technician. You being on the tools would actually annoy people because you've hired people to do that. Letting go. Like that's what I was about to say. That's the dichotomy of um, everything you kind of just said then around, you know, you you got your hands on the steering wheel, but you have to let people also come in and tell you where to go at the same time and and letting go of some of the, maybe the responsibilities you used to have and, and, you know, you when you, you talked about it, you're high, if you hire great people and then you start just telling them what to do all the time, it probably is not going to end up too well. No, A players don't want to be told what to do. They want opportunity. They want accountability. And they want to be given targets and goals and challenged. They want to be challenged. And they want to, you know, they want to be give the opportunity to, 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 to meet those challenges. And they want to grow. So, um yeah, it's a whole other world, like, you know, startup phase to scale-up phase. Um, and it's it's different. Mm. It's different. And it's not for everybody. I think a lot of founders, they go through a stage where they transition from founder to CEO and they realise, hey, perhaps I don't want to be a CEO, um, which is interesting. And perhaps uh, I'm just mainly entrepreneurial and I want to just just build and create and not operationalize because that's what it's about it's really you know scaling a business it's really about operationalizing things Mm. not just people but processes and systems and repeatability and predictability and and building a better machine right because when you start a company you know you get your first sales whatever you build up to a million dollars right it's not really that operationalized you know i talked about one channel imagine if you had 10 yeah. Right? And you've got 10 people managing all those different channels, right? And then you've got 10 people working on different fulfillment because you've got different lines of products. Like, so it's really about operationalizing things as well. I'd love to dive into that because my, like the final question before we go into quick fire was going to be, you know, I, I, I think everyone has their philosophy and the way they think about business. Now, obviously there's the guiding principles, there's there are those kind of rocks that we know have worked and have done, but I know that you know every <laughs> every founder and CEO will look at a business and go, "Hey, if I was to go into a clean slate tomorrow and I had to operate a certain way, I had to kind of build this a, a business out. This is how I would do it." Um, and then you kind of talked about this word operationalize, and I'd love for you to just dive into that a little bit in detail. Like, you know, when we talk about operationalizing you know, a, a company, what are we kind of talking about? And what does that actually look like? Yeah, so look, I'm going to make no claim that I'm good at this stuff because <laughs> I'm learning, right? Like, uh, and that's the that's that's the crazy part, right? Like, I'm sitting here and I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say I've got it all worked out. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm working out as I go. Um, so, uh, when I say operationalize, I think it's, it's, it's really about people, it's about rhythms and it's about predictability. Mm. Um, predictability in revenue, predictability in fulfillment, predictability in experience for the customer or the you know the end user. Um, and it's 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 building a better machine, right? Like imagine you had a you know a, a Lego a Lego thing that you put together and then you break it and you rebuild it again but it's bigger, badder, and bolder, and it looks awesome, right? So, so it's, it's no dissimilar. Um, it's, it's simplifying things. I think a lot of operationalizing things is, is removing complexity. Mm. Um, you know, I think uh, over time when you're trying to scale it, it creates chaos and there's a lot of mess. Uh, so how can, you, how can you add simplicity? It's, it's looking to, to remove wastage, Uh yeah, things like that. Yeah, it's interesting, like, it's... Because it is, like, people process software. Like, how do yeah. we kind of get all that into one and then, you know, simplify those processes so that we can scale them out and multiple people can come in and deliver on that? Mm. Um, and the predictability side of it fit that you said, I think that's, like, such a really good point because you don't have that in the first part of the business. You're just kind of running through walls as quickly as and as fast as you can. Um, you don't, you know, if you, you, you just, you don't, you can't create that predictability at the start. But then 
I think the transition to start trying to create a predictability is like a mindset shift and it kind of talks to everything we've said so far, which I really loved. Um, that, that point, I think that's such a big, big point um, in regards to that scale up part as well. Is like, okay, if we can't, you know, like when you start looking, you know, maybe beyond uh, two quarters and, and kind of, you know, where are we going to be in 12 months' time? Where are we going to be in two years' time? Where are we working towards in, in five years' time? And really start to – like, you can always – I feel like at the start you kind of have this vision and you're like, yeah, that's where we want to be in five years. But you don't re- – you just go, okay, well, what do we need to do next week? <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But then eventually you start to build out, you know, um, and predict what, where you might be in a year. What are your financial models then? What does the infrastructure in the business look like then? You know, and that's all obviously guiding towards – the strategy which is going to take you towards that vision. So I think the points you made were absolutely amazing around that. Um, quick fire. So quick, we, uh, a segment that we do is quick fire. I always have to preface this. It's not uh, – we, we, some people have made some jokes in the past that it's slow fire. It's not that you have to be on the clock or it's a short answer, um, but it's just these kind of like really broad questions that people get a lot of value from. Mm. What's one piece of advice for your younger self? Have more fun. What about it? Why? Why why is having fun important? Oh, man. Just like I keep saying, life's too short, right? Life's too short to not do work you enjoy. Life's too short not to have more fun. I don't know. I think in my earlier years, I probably could have traveled more, could have more fun, lived a bit more. Not Not be caught up and worried about you know, my career or what other people are doing and all this kind of stuff. Like I know some of the people listening to this might be looking at certain people online and they're only 19 or 18 or 20 or 22 or whatever. But like those are the years you just have more fun. Like I wouldn't worry about making all this money or building a business and looking like a boss or any of that kind of rubbish. I just focus on having way more fun and traveling more. I love it. So what's... What's a uh, one piece of advice you would give to someone who's thinking of starting a business or has just started a business? Oh, look, the first thing that came to mind was just this idea of never giving up. I think a lot of people say, like, it's, it's this interesting thing. A lot of people say that, you know, you shouldn't beat a dead horse or, like, you know, sometimes when it comes to a business, if you're not getting that traction, let it go. But... I subscribe to this philosophy that if you never give up, you and if you want it bad enough, you will find a way. And I think that's absolutely critical. Um, so if you're looking to start a business or you've recently launched something, you have to find a way where you just want it bad enough and you will do whatever it takes, no matter how impossible. Do you think that's the decision you have to make when you start a business? Because like it's, and what I mean by that is like we obviously talked about it at the beginning, but it was like you know, the decision, okay, if I'm actually going to do this and we're really going to have a crack at it, then it's got to be we're doing this at all costs. Yeah, it's interesting you asked me that question because I was thinking to myself, I didn't decide that straight away, to be Mm. honest with you, Kyle. Um, For me, I wanted to explore something else, which was Founder, but... To even get Founder up and running, I never forget, I asked Emily, we went to the zoo and we're only early days dating and we went to the zoo and I said to her, I said, hey, I said, how hard I work on building Founder, it wasn't even called Founder at the time, but that's a whole other story, but um, do you think I work hard enough on Founder that maybe one day this might become something that I work on full time? And she said, no. (laughs) So... Damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so that t- that paints a picture that you don't have to have it all worked out at the start or before because I certainly didn't. Mm. Um, what, what shifted for me though was when I launched it, it was so exciting. It was so exhilarating and it, it, I felt alive. Mm. And it was this addictive rush and feeling that um, – yeah, it was really exciting and I, I just I just grabbed onto it and it was just so much fun. And uh, yeah, that's 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 how I kind of eventually worked it out. I love that. It's kinda like I always say this to myself internally, like if it if I'm if if I fear it, 
but it's exciting, it's probably a good idea. You know what I mean? Like if I'm excited about it. So I love the excitement piece. All right, so what's the most important trait that a founder must have for success and why? Um, I think self-awareness. Uh, I know Gary V talks a lot about this. Mm. I think it is so, 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 so critical. Um, like the the growth of a company is the reflection, I believe, of of, of a founder's self growth, like their their own personal growth. Mm. That's why at founder the work that we do, I'm so passionate about it because I know we can really help people, whether it's through enrolling in Founder Plus in our online programs or whatever it is, or, or listening to a podcast or reading a piece of content. Like we are just delivering so much to help you grow. And so your self-awareness around where you're at, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, where you're holding the business back, what are your blind spots and trying to continually finding them and having that self-awareness or putting yourself out there or being challenged by others and being vulnerable and open to let people in and all of that, I think that is so critical for a founder to succeed uh, because, yeah, like, you know, entrepreneurs are modern day artists they you know they paint and they and they create things right and mm. and and it's a canvas you when you start a business it's a blank canvas and you can you can shape it and you can you can mold it however you want and i think having that self awareness is so 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 critical to be able to get where you want to go i love it self awareness is oh, i mean just for life in general mm. i think it's just such a it's it's a superpower so absolutely love that Mate, I want to say a massive thank you for coming on the show. Um, you know, I think what you're doing is amazing. I know it's helped me along a lot along the way as well and definitely recommend checking it out, Founder Plus. Um, when I seen that, I was like, oh, to be honest, I was like, you know, I knew that was where it was going to go eventually because you are just delivering so much value in terms of, and, and a lot of the courses you're bringing out are amazing, so definitely recommend. But where can, where can everyone find yourself and Founder and, and you know, you know get in touch with the the business yeah just go to founder.com so it's founder without the e we'd love to help you on your journey wherever you're at um kyle talked about founder plus that's our all access membership pass where you can access all of our courses we're releasing tons of new courses all the time and we're really just finding some of the greatest entrepreneurs of our generation to teach all sorts of cutting edge topics whether it's on marketing finance business growth starting a business any kind of business and so much more incredible community. We'd love to serve you. And if not, please do follow our content. We produce a ton of free stuff. We're here to help serve however we can. Beautiful. Marto, thanks for putting this together. Nath, again, thanks for coming on. And to our audience, uh, thank you for all the support. Um, as I said, we get to do this because of you. So um, keep it coming. And hopefully we keep bringing you guys value. But really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll see you next week. <laughs>